Friends. So, welcome to the last of our discussions about the presidency and the court, this one being about the presidency, presidential powers. And um, first, uh, I'm going to introduce very briefly everybody on the panel. To my immediate left is the inimitable and indomitable John Q. Barrett, of whom you've heard much, a professor at St. John's Law School and the living, breathing Jackson scholar. And those of you who aren't on his list, you should be, his email list. Um, and sitting next to him is John Dean, who served as counsel to President Nixon, star witness against President Nixon, um, a distinguished uh, professor himself, a schol dis uh, visiting scholar at the Annenberg School of Communications at the University of Southern California, and he's written a ton of books. I'm not going to tell you what they all are, but I always tell you what the l latest one is, if it's just out. And this one is called um, Broken Government, How Republican Rule Destroyed the Legislative, Executive, and Judicial Branches. Subtle title. Subtle, very subtle. <laughs> <laughs> and next is Beth Nolan, who is about to become counsel for George Washington University and who served as counsel to President Clinton. And sitting next to her is Anthony Lewis, who won a Pulitzer Prize for covering the Supreme Court for the New York Times and went on to write one of the most notable columns for the New York Times for I don't know how long. I'm sure he could, he will, will and can tell us. And lastly, uh, Ambassador Boyden Gray, who served as counsel to the first President Bush, um, has very graciously agreed to join this panel because I viewed it as a little bit politically tilted. And, uh, <laughs> and he was here, and with no advance warning, he has incredibly graciously agreed to be on this panel, which, as I say, is a little bit of ganging up on him, I think. Um, and he has to leave early because he has another, uh, he has to go into the city. So I'm going to get him out of here a little early, but uh, he has my eternal gratitude for agreeing to do this. So just as a short overview, um, we don't have any long prepared stuff. I don't have to in interrupt anybody on this panel. Um, but they all ha do have things they do want to say. So every president in modern times has claimed significant executive power. And every p president in more modern times, as far as I know, has claimed more executive power than he got away with. Even, FB even FDR, who tried to pack the court. Uh, Truman tried to seize the steel mills. Nixon claimed immunity from the criminal justice system. Clinton from the civil justice system. Reagan from congressional oversight. And Bush from judicial and congressional oversight, not to mention, to some extent, in terms of new, a new secrecy regime, uh, public accountability. So how much has President Bush changed the equation here? He got pushed back by the Supreme Court three times so far, but every time he's gone back to the well in Congress, and he got pretty much what he wanted when he asked for it. And neither the court nor the Congress has really pushed back on a lot of other subjects. The administration, to cite just one example, it's small, but it is, I think, emblematic, uh, still has not allowed the Judiciary Committee of the Senate or the House to see the legal opinions, the, just the legal rationales issued by the Justice Department uh, on torture. What's more, in an era when government um, can tell with far more precision, precision who's talking to whom, I would argue that, uh, at least until recently, leaks were harder to come by. So I have a, a way to start this off, which is, do, do the panelists think that the Pentagon Papers could have been published today? Let's assume uh, a New York Times reporter gets hold of a report on, compiled by this administration on how we got into Iraq and what our real prospects are for prevailing there. First of all, would the New York Times publish it? Would the Washington Post publish it when it caught up a couple of days later? 
Well, that's historically accurate. <laughs> would the administration try to stop it? And would the courts intervene to prevent the administration from stopping it? So uh, I think, uh, Tony Lewis, you were actually there working for the Times um, at the time of the, of the Pentagon Papers. So why don't I, I start with you? And then I'll go to Boyd and Gray and then come up the line, so, so to speak. Or anybody can jump in. It doesn't really matter. I just want to get this started. Well, Nina, I thank you for starting with me. But I wasn't, in fact, there. I was in London for the New York Times. Well, yeah, but you were in but I, I, for the I've New York Times. I've thought about it a lot since and taught the case every year for about 25 years. So I, I'm prepared to answer your question. The answer is yes, the New York Times would publish it, uh, publish that material. There was a brief period, not so brief, unfortunately, after the um, invasion of Iraq, when I think the answer might have been no. Uh, the Times and the Post were both uh, very lax in their coverage of the process of getting into the war. And then some months later, we both amazingly published apologies on behalf of the management for our lack of curiosity and diligence in uncovering the process that led to the war. So I have no doubt now, in the light of what's happened since the reporting on matters such as um, warrantless wiretapping, the existence of the torture memoranda, the existence of secret prisons abroad, which that was a great Washington Post scoop. Uh, we should give credit where it's due. Um, and I have no doubt now that we've published. And I'm inclined to think that if the same process happened as in the Pentagon Papers, Crucially, the New York Times published for three days before court injunction stopped us. I say it's crucial because if the Nixon administration had, to, had known about it, didn't know we were going to publish, and had stopped the publication, gone to a court before anything had been published, there would have been it would have been much easier for the government to speculate about how damaging this material was going to be and how it would destroy the country and the North Vietnamese army would be walking down Broadway and all that. Uh, when three days had been published, and it was obvious to anybody who read them that that wasn't the case, that it was history, and that it wasn't likely to have any effect, certainly the trial judge, Judge Gerfine, thought it wouldn't have any significant effect. And uh, if the same process adhered here, and something had already been published, I think the courts would not sustain an administration effort to stop the publication. Borden Gray, what do you think, and do you think in my hypothetical, do you think it should be stopped? No, and I don't think it would be. And uh, I think, parenthetically, uh, if you want to know why we're in the war in Iraq, I think there's been plenty of disclosure, not in, a integrated piece of, in an integrated document like the Pentagon Papers, but there's been plenty of disclosure, much of it, I think, probably unwelcome by uh, the White House. And, and one issue I want to throw in here, and I uh, don't want to distract, but the reporter's privilege has been watered down too, which I think is, a, is also a breach into, if you will, into, uh, into secrecy um, uh, in, in a perverse sort of way. Uh, but that's a factor too. And if you look at the Plain case, um, uh, a lot came out in the course of that prosecution. Um, I'm not sure it was uh, journalism's finest hour but it has led to even more access, I think, rather than less uh, in the short run, although in the long run, maybe, uh, Tony Lewis would persuade us that uh, any infringement on the reporter's privilege is a long-term uh, disbenefit. But I do think it's relevant uh, to the debate. Um, I wonder uh, two things, whether, uh, first of all, somebody who wanted to leak it would have access to that kind of information today because there's been such a much closer hold on information so that even we know even the legal opinions written by the Office of Legal Counsel at Justice uh, weren't provided to the agencies they affected. So uh, I, I think the um, chances of something that, like that being leaked today would be quite different. And then secondly, I, don't, I, don't, I doubt it would ever get to court. Um, I think what you'd have is the White House going to the New York Times and trying to prevail upon them not to publish. I'll, I'll um, uh, accept Tony's view that the Times would anyway, but I, 
you know, I don't actually know, depending on what information the White House provided, whether that would happen or not. Dana? Yeah. Can I just throw something in here, even though I've had a turn? <laughs> in fact, just maybe in partial agreement, but only partial with mm -hmm. Beth, it took the Times a year after the <coughs> White House went and talked to the New York Times. It took the Times a year to decide to publish the story about warrantless wiretapping. I was there. <laughs> Not true. <laughs> and Tony, maybe it's a good thing you weren't because the first request I had from the president was the old 1917 Espionage Act with criminal sanctions available against the reporters at the New York Times. Uh, I actually ended up sending that information over to Bill Rehnquist, who was then the head of the Office of Legal Counsel. Bill was out of the office at the time. He had a bad back and was home recuperating. So his deputy, but I'm sure Bill was involved in, in the uh, sifting through of the decision, uh, Tom Kuiper came back with a memo saying, yes, they probably are liable, but it's been the longtime policy of the Department of Justice not to prosecute criminally uh, for this type of offense. Uh, I don't know if you're going to stay on this subject, but of course that was just the opening shot uh, because a few days later when Henry came back, uh, who had been out of town, uh, he would change the president's mind about an awful lot of things and we would uh, march forward to what became uh, U.S. versus New York Times, but we can explore that if you want to. I defer to all of this. I was a 10-year-old in Milwaukee at the time. <laughs> You are not supposed to do that on this panel to make us all feel old. But I read and watched them on TV. Um, I think Iraq is actually too, e and Iraq in 2007 is too easy a hypothetical because we have traveled a huge distance in the public concern and the journalistic culture. Um, I think a, a better, tougher hypothetical is a report concerning Iran and reports concerning, and uh, this is entirely hypothetical, I have no clearances or knowledge, ongoing covert team deployments in Iran, let's say, or let's say Pakistan, and ongoing intelligence gathering, factional infiltration, um, security, leadership, instability, coup assessment in Pakistan. If that were the report, a front burner contemporary issue where we haven't culturally traveled a huge distance. Um, I think it's probably a tougher question for the New York Times. I defer to Tony and journalists on that. I think it's probably a closer question for the Department of Justice, even with new and I think more capable sober leadership today. If it pursued some kind of prior restraint, I think one more piece to add in that's significant is the new state secrets culture that is part of our litigation landscape. Um, under the Bush administration, particularly in the context of civil cases arising against phone companies for privacy statute violations and so forth. It's not a damage assessment claim of privilege, which was the kind of argument that Erwin Griswold made in the, in the Pentagon Papers case, that the sky would fall if the publication continued. It instead is simply an argument for privilege and thus immunity from judicial process based on the fact of classification. And that is, and not a new development, it's something that's existed in our law for 50 or more years. It came to the Supreme Court in an odd uh, wrongful death action in the 1950s, but it's been dusted off and used aggressively in litigation today. And so if this proposed publication resulted in the proposed action of some kind um, and got into court and a court was proposing to adjudicate this in a hostile way, uh, there's a different argument to sort of shut that judicial restraint down. It's a, an executive branch classification power against judicial accountability. And that's a very live matter. I think that this administration would argue that, as, in, as it has in a whole variety of other contexts, that this is a different kind of war than we have ever been in before. And that therefore, the rules are somewhat different. Uh, the position of any president has to be much more aggressive and that a kind of secrecy that we really haven't tolerated except in the middle of a, of a, uh, of a 
kind of censorship kind of regime of a battlefront, more traditional circumstance is tolerable in our civilian <coughs> court system. I'm wondering whether, what everybody's thoughts are on whether that's at all justified. Well, Nina, let me, can I drop in here just, <clears throat> I think we ought to distinguish between surveillance of U.S. citizens and, and surveillance that may take place with U.S. instrumentalities of, of foreign uh, potential terrorists. And uh, a couple of, uh, my memory's a little bit down there because I was given too little time, no time to sort of prepare for this. I <laughs> couldn't refresh my memory about the disclosure which caused bin Laden to stop using uh, cell phones. But uh, uh, there was a disclosure of sources and methods which did uh, cost us uh, an extremely lucrative uh, in, uh, line into what he was doing. Uh, more recently, uh, uh, I think uh, that was in court, actually. Well, maybe, but uh, yeah. more recently, the New York Times, uh, I believe, ra rather regrettably, and I think they've apologized since, uh, revealed the existence of the SWIFT. How many people here know of SWIFT? Uh, mm. Which is good uh, that nobody really knows about it because the New York Times <laughs> didn't do that much damage. Um, but it caused huge problems in Europe. SWIFT is a is a mechanism by which uh, uh, Treasury uh, will sift through huge amounts of uh, commercial transactional data uh, to try to find uh, you know, uh, money transfers abroad between terrorist uh, or organizations. It doesn't really involve U.S. citizens, but there has to be some safeguard uh, to assure the public that that, in fact, is the case. Uh, caused the, uh, uh, you know, it's, the White House mishandled it because they should have alerted the European authorities where the sensitivity uh, uh, arose. Um, uh, they should have alerted the, the, the EU authorities that this was happening so they weren't blindsided when the, when the New York Times published it. Um, but um, uh, it's a very, very valuable resource and the question that, that has been raised since is how much value was lost when the Times uh, published it? How many leads have been dried up? How many uh, uh, possible plots have been lost uh, because of the publication? John Dean, let me ask you, um, since you raised the subject of what happened with the Pentagon Papers, and you said things changed when Henry returned. So this is, after all, a, a presidential library's discussion. What changed, without getting into such enormous detail, but what changed, and, and how, did, how did that play out? Well, if you recall what happened the weekend in June that the uh, Pentagon Papers were first published on the front page of a Sunday New York Times was the same weekend that Tricia had her wedding at the White House. And the president went in and looked at the Sunday paper uh, really for the see how the coverage of the wedding had been. <laughs> and there he saw this enormous column uh, about uh, the history of the war in Vietnam. And his initial reaction, uh, at least what I was told, was not that particularly negative. He thought this indeed might be good because it was gonna make the Democrats look bad. Uh, so he wasn't concerned. And it wasn't until Kissinger started telling him that uh, he, as a, uh, a negotiator for the government, first in, uh, in Paris with their secret negotiations with North Vietnam would be having trouble if the North Vietnamese did not believe the United States could keep its secrets. And the button he really pushed that got Nixon's attention uh, was that uh, this could indeed jeopardize the planned China initiative. Uh, that's when everything changed. Uh, there are fascinating tapes. Uh, the change first came to my attention when a fellow who had been assigned to my staff walked in, a former New York City detective, and he was wide-eyed. And uh, Jack Caulfield wasn't somebody who was wide-eyed at many things at all. Uh, but Jack came in and said, I just came from Chuck Colson's office. Colson wants me to firebomb the Brookings Institute. <laughs> I said, come again, Jack? <laughs> and he explained that, that uh, Chuck said that the president believed that there were a copy of the Pentagon Papers in the Brookings Institute and that uh, he wanted, the, the plan would be to have 
a firebomb, and when the, uh, when the fire department responded, uh, that Caulfield was to arrange to have burglars to go in and crack the safe. And I said, you're not serious. He said, Colson is deadly serious. I said, Jack, don't do a thing. Uh, the president wasn't there. Uh, the, uh, the senior staff was in San Clemente. So I figured I, this was going to take an eyeball to eyeball meeting. So I flew to San Clemente on the next courier flight and got a hold of, of Ehrlichman the next morning and explained what I had heard. And I said, John, I said, this is just insane. In fact, I had pulled the statute off of my shelf and said, you know, it is a capital offense in the District of Columbia if somebody dies as a result of arson. And I said, what if that's traced right back to the White House where it seems to be coming from? He, he looked at me over his glasses and he, he then picked up the phone and got the Chuck Colson on the uh, phone immediately from the White House operator and said, Chuck, uh, young counsel Dean is out here and he doesn't think the plan for Brookings is very good. Call, <laughs> call it off. And he looked at me and he said, anything else, counsel? And I said, I said that'll handle it this morning and returned uh, to, uh, to Washington. That's how things changed. Uh, so, but... And, and incidentally, the Brookings Institute has never thanked me for saving that building. <laughs> <laughs> but, interestingly, Kissinger's objections to the publication strike me as, well, as a re reporter or even a citizen, I don't buy them as a justification for a prior restraint. They are nonetheless not crazy concerns. No, they aren't. So, and this administration, in a, in a really novel situation of terrorism, has many concerns that are not crazy. The question is, how do you draw the line? And historically, each one of the many demarcations that we've seen, people are always coming into new situations. I'm sure that President Roosevelt thought that the threat that Adolf Hitler posed was every bit as serious as the one that we think is posed by, by terrorism today. But there, and there are some things that he did, like the internment of the Japanese, that we're all ashamed of today. So how do we know which are the things that are, we're going to be ashamed of, and which are the things we shouldn't do, and which are the things we should do? Let me ask, put that to the councils, to the presidents. I'll start. Um, I don't think you ever really know. What you have to do is have a system for decision making that takes account of everyone's constitutional role in, in those decisions. And that means, I think, appropriate consultation with Congress. It means uh, getting statutory authority when you need it as opposed to just deciding that you don't want to follow the law. I, I do think there are times when it's appropriate for a president to determine that a law is so unconstitutional that um, the president will not um, implement that law. But I don't, I don't think that can be a regular or should be a regular occurrence. And, uh, so I, and I think it's a matter of using the expertise in the executive branch and making sure that you're not cutting out the people who have the greatest expertise in certain areas in making those decisions. So I, I really think it's a process question and you still may end up wrong, but at least you'll have done your best. Ambassador Gray? Uh, I, part of me says that, that I mean, I, don't, just, I agree with everything Beth, Beth Nolan says, but my, my difference might be that I think that where the action is, is further up the line. Uh, if you're going to try to anticipate things, you have to get back into uh, the organizations that you're combating. And there, the question really becomes, uh, how, do you, how do you deal with your, with your allies? How do you share information with, the, with your allies? And then when the information comes in, how do you share it internally? The FBI still, to my knowledge, uh, does not have uh, the capacity to, to uh, Google itself. Um, in other words, you put in uh, airplane flights and uh, you can't Google all the stuff that's in the system at the FBI and come up with uh, a, a, an ability to connect the dots. They still don't have the technology to do that. 
And um, uh, at least they didn't the last time I uh, looked. And that's, if they had that, I think 9-11 could have been averted. But I think the big focus is, I mean, I sometimes worry that we get too, um, too obsessed with a memo here and a memo there. I'm not saying that some of these memos can be justified. The White House and the Office of Legal Counsel pull back some of them. Um, but I do think that uh, the more difficult questions come with how do you organize this with your allies, how do you uh, do these uh, uh, intelligence operations abroad. Uh, I, I think it's true that anything that involved uh, the placement of assets in a foreign country, the President has to sign a finding, and that is communicated to the top people in the House and Senate. And sometimes they have been known to run straight to CBS and disclose it to the world. But generally speaking, it's been pretty airtight. I don't know that the public should know about that. I think there are enough uh, enough uh, checks and balances in the system. But to me, that's where the key issue is. If you're if you're dealing with uh, with a captured agent uh, somewhere, and you know you're off, awfully late in the game. Uh, I think the idea really should be to organize yourself to catch this stuff as it's beginning, and that is um, not so exotic and not so romantic, uh, but still extremely uh, extremely difficult bureaucratically. Well, the way we were organized for quite some time um, was repudiated by the Supreme Court in Hamdi, in a, Hamdan and Razul. And Hamdi probably is the, the quintessential case because that involved an American citizen actually captured on the battlefield in Afghanistan. He says he was turned over by a, you know, for bounty by some warlord. But whether or not he was is in some respects irrelevant because we let him go eventually once the Supreme Court said you're going to have to either come up with the evidence in some fashion or let him go, we let him go. Um, we have, there have been a lot of extraordinary assertions of executive power and limited to very few people within the, an inner circle in the White House. And I know that, um, and the question is how much we can allow that as a free society to go on with, and still call ourselves a free society, Tony Lewis. Uh, was that Tony? We're we going to finish the, you wanted the council to finish on. I thought you, already, I wanted, I thought you already said what you said. Oh, no, I, mean, I had. I, I okay, wanted to all say right. something about the previous. Could I say something about the previous question before we get on to your very important new question? I think you gave Henry Kissinger a free pass, quite unjustifiably. I think Kissinger's. Uh, expostulations about the need to go after the Pentagon Papers and the New York Times were outrageous and motivated by factors that had nothing to do with the national security. Uh, the Haldeman Diaries say that he said, we might as well give up our government and turn it all over to the Soviet Union. We can't keep a secret. Mao will never talk to us now that he sees the New York Times publishes everything we do. Now, I want to ask you. Mao Zedong changed the policy of his entire life and decided that it was an urgent national interest of China to engage with the United States. Is he going to look at a headline in the New York Times and change that? That's a joke. That's just a joke. And furthermore, six months after the Pentagon Papers was the case was decided by the Supreme Court, the toughest man in the Justice Department, the head of the Internal Security Division, Robert Mardian, prosecuting Daniel Ellsberg, asked the Pentagon for some backup on how serious this violation of classification rules was in the leakage of the secrecy. And he wrote a memorandum to Attorney General Mitchell saying, the Pentagon answered my question, it's all rubbish. There are no secrets. They can't tell me anything. That was the great secret of the Pentagon Papers. And we've got to be skeptical, ladies and gentlemen, when they claim the house is about to fall down or the sky is about to fall, check it out. As the Solicitor General himself later learned and right. regretted having argued the case as aggressively as he had. Uh, we were following up along on the, uh, on the former White House counsel. I'm losing control on, here. On, on, this, on, on, this, on this question on process you were really raising, but really it's a policy question too of how we would deal today uh, with the situation of terrorism uh, and is there the justification. Well, obviously, I think I think Borden is correct. The decision has been made at the top this time. Uh, the process that uh, Beth mentioned has not been employed, and the decision has been we're at war. That we haven't even looked at the other alternatives, and we've classified this as World War III for our, all practical purposes. I'm not so sure that's a correct classification. Uh, it, most of the reading I do, a lot of experts in this area seem to think it isn't uh, you can't end terrorism with war. You can't kill 
gnats with cannons. You need very effective law enforcement. And you need a very effective diplomacy. This is a very uh, widespread problem. And to make the decision uh, based on the fact that we're at war makes it very easy. And then when you look at the, dis the memos that are justifying the actions based on the fact that we're in an emergency situation, that we are at war, and I'm thinking specifically of, of the memos that uh, people like John Yu cranked out uh, early and justified things like uh, torture, going to war in Iraq, uh, getting around the Attorney General and, 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 and uh, back-channeling it right into the Vice President's office. You know, these are really quite extraordinary documents, not only in the procedure and process that was followed, but in the content that was involved in them. They are, they border on fraud as far as intellectual honesty. Let me take a quick historian's cut on Nina's question. How do we know today if a proposed executive action is justified or will be one of those disasters that we regret? And I, I think the short answer, I don't mean to be flip about it, is we won't know till later. It really is a process and risk question now, and it is an executive branch responsibility of, of great weight and, and hopefully great sobriety and expertise as those decisions are being made. Um, I think the process is not simply the first decision, but also the reassessment process, the closing of a course of action. For example, and, and I think this is this is not controversial in the historiography of the Japanese-American internment. It is easy to look at that story in 1944 and be horrified and say that it had become indefensible. And guess who said that first? It was the Roosevelt administration through the War Department that announced its closure of the camps on Sunday, December 17, 1944 which is the day before the Supreme Court decided the infamous Korematsu decision and the completely forgotten Endo decision. It's the slow and refusing to reconsider course that is, in history's eyes, a serious process problem. You think that was really re-looking at it, or do you think that they were worried about what the court would do? I think they were, I think they had a leak and they were getting out ahead of the court, if only by a day. The court, as few remember, actually struck down the internment system. That's what the Endo case is about, a conceitedly loyal American. No evidence of her disloyalty. And the court holds unanimously that her incarceration is illegal. What the court is upholding in Korematsu, three years into this horrific system, is the exclusion that threw young Fred Korematsu out of San Francisco and sent him to a racetrack to report for further shipment inland to an internment camp. And that was not a real question in 1944. It may well have been, or a curfew may well have been, in the second, third, and fourth weeks of December 1941. And where an executive branch fails, I think, is when it stops looking at its watch, when it says, we are on a course, this is our course forever, the stakes are always the same. The stakes change. And history will look back on a process that hasn't recalibrated and find a disaster much more than it will look back on a careful, ongoing process, because that will be more sophisticated well, and careful. Hasn't this administration, in fact, to some extent done that? I mean, it got worried about in Hamdi that he hadn't seen his lawyer for the whole time he'd been. Then suddenly the case goes to the Supreme Court. The court surprisingly agrees to hear it. And, oh, hello, you can see your lawyer now. I mean, that's very much the same kind of thing, isn't it? Yes, it is, although in today's War on Terror, I would say that the legal issues the Supreme Court has dealt with really nibble around the edges of the major executive policy questions. The, the purchase that the legal system and the courts has been able to get is on the enemy combatant designations, Guantanamo as a facility, and the availability of habeas corpus. That doesn't get to the huge questions, um, Iraq troop surge or withdrawal, military attacks, closing Guantanamo, ceasing rendition, torture if we're doing it, et cetera. Those aren't questions that the court can touch. The court is out on the periphery, but the president is at the core. And so those are things that I think this process question that Beth and the other White House counsel have spoken to is, is, is really focused on. Let me ask um, Ambassador Gray something before we lose him in about 20 minutes. Um, Jack Goldsmith's very interesting book draws a parallel between, or a, con uh, a contradiction really, between Roosevelt and President Bush, and says that 
even though President Roosevelt did a lot of things that are sort of right on the cusp of legality, uh, lend lease, um, and a, a couple of other things, he does everything in his in the destroyer thing. Um, he, he does everything in his power to get the other branches to sign on, and to make his administration as bipartisan and the as possible. So he brings Republicans into top jobs in his administration as Secretary of War, Secretary of the Navy, et cetera. He consults extensively with Congress in a bipartisan fashion. Um, he threatens Congress. He basically says, you do this, and if you don't do it, I'm going to do it. But he does, he plays all the angles in a way to, to achieve some sort of a bipartisan consensus that allows him to do what he thinks is necessary for the national security. And Goldsmith faults his former boss, the President of the United States, President Bush, for not doing that, for limiting, in fact, to the tightest group possible uh, in the White House uh, these decisions, for not really consulting Congress, for not bringing in people from uh, the opposition party into the administration, for not even consulting the JAGs about key things involved in everything from Guantanamo to the way he questioned people who were captured. All, he faults the, this president for not following the Roosevelt model, and thereby it's his argument, Boyden, that this president in the last analysis injured executive power. Is that unfair? Um, you know, I've been uh, maybe blissfully um, out of the country for much of this, so, but, um, uh, I mean, it's a very good question. My experience was, and we have a senator here, and he's not going to be able to be allowed, allowed to speak uh, unless you give him the microphone, uh, which, which I think would be a good thing to do right now, but there has been... When you been, leave, uh, we'll get him up here. Um, <laughs> there, there, um, in, in recent years, which I don't, uh, don't think happened in the Roosevelt years, in recent years there's just been a pattern of senators getting these very, very good nuggets of information and then, and then, and then leaking them. And um, I, you know, don't ask me to give you chapter and verse, but um, one senator I think was relieved of his, uh, no, I won't go in, uh, <laughs> but, but, it, but it has happened t too many times. So I, in some ways, am quite sympathetic to the president I'm wanting to share information. now. That were some of these memos overdone? They were overdone. And go, is Goldsmith right that it ended up, the backlash ended up doing more harm than good? Uh, I think on some aspects of that, from what I've known and from what I've been able to read, Goldsmith's probably right. Uh, but people do make mistakes, and uh, uh, nobody's immune. If you, if you really look at the big picture, though, I mean, I, I'd like to ask uh, um, the, the people up here, the panel up here, especially, uh, well, the professor, but. Um, well, we have, do we have two professors? Beth, are you a professor? Not anymore. Not anymore. Um, uh, you know, Rosa ex party Quirin, where he took the German saboteurs, and that was pretty, um, that was pretty rough. Um, maybe ex party Quirin has now been overruled. I could never quite figure out in reading the, trying to read the Hamby decision whether uh, the current court has overruled ex party Quirin. But uh, that, that's a pretty tough thing, as was uh, the, you know, the recitation yesterday by Justice O'Connor of uh, all the laws but one. Um, in time of war, in time of stress, the presidents have done some pretty rough things. And if you take uh, the suspension of habeas corpus, you take ex parte Quirin, I'm not sure that anything President Bush has done uh, is as, is as uh, sweeping as, as, as either of those two, uh, two assertions of power. Uh, I've been given permission to follow up <laughs> you don't to, need my to ask you a, a question about when you were there. Uh, I'm thinking of when Bush won, went to Kuwait, uh, and the way the process was followed there, and indeed a strong coalition was assembled, uh, a lot of time was taken, and a Secretary of Defense by the name of Cheney was arguing to the White House, uh, maybe to you, maybe to the President directly, we don't need the permission of Congress to do this. We don't need this coalition to do this. In fact, he was trying to sell a secret plan uh, around the Joint Chiefs. Uh, is this the sort of thing that, can you tell us anything about how this was rebuffed and how the coalition was built? And well, the coalition was built by the President uh, from almost from day one with a, a grand assistance from Secretary Baker and 
Pickering at the UN. I mean, I, I don't know anything about this secret plan. Uh, it is true that Gates did not uh, want to go to Congress to get uh, advance approval, uh, authorization to use force, but neither did Snoo, neither did Scowcroft, neither did Baker. The only people who wanted to do it were the President and Quayle and me. Um, uh, but we did it, and it was very, very close, as you probably know, 51, 49, or something like that. And, uh, but it was a great, great thing to have done, and the President was quite determined. I mean, he wasn't going to hear no from anybody, and no came from almost everybody. And there's some great scenes. You know, I can remember uh, uh, being dispatched to go down to the Hill to meet with uh, Dole, who was then, uh, I guess he was, Min was he, Min he was minority yeah. leader. Uh, we yeah. didn't have control of the Senate, but everyone in his caucus was there, everybody, all 46 whatever senators there were, what to do? Where were, where were we? Uh, and so it's Scowcroft and it's, and it's uh, Gates, and it's me, and little old me. And the, Gates so, or Cheney? Excuse me, Cheney. 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 And uh, permit me to tell this, this anecdote. because it's, so, so Dole says, all right, here's the state of play. We have the Solos Amendment, which authorizes the use of force. That's passed the uh, House. We have the defeat in the Senate of the non Mitchell, I have the votes to defeat non Mitchell in the Senate, which would deny the use of force. Right now, I don't have the votes to get Solars uh, to authorize positively use of force, but I don't have the votes yet. I don't know that I can get them, but I have defeated the negative. And I propose, gentlemen, that that's enough. And is that not enough uh, for us to go forward? And I looked at Scowcroft, and I looked at Cheney, and neither of them said anything, and the seconds ticked by. And, you know, what am I going to do? Because I haven't discussed this with him. So I say, no, uh, Mr. Leader, that's not enough. We actually have to have uh, law here, and the Solar Amendment has to pass the Senate. And without any hesitation, he slapped his knee and said, well, if that's the way it has to be, gentlemen, that's what we'll try to do. And, um, you know, did, 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 did Cheney sit there and say, no, 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 and start screaming? No, 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 no. no. So I don't know what you're he, talking he, about. He was, just mean, telling um, the, he was just telling the Senate that the president didn't need that, to have the authority that you were telling him they needed to have. Well, I don't know that he was telling the Senate. I don't know when anyone ever told the Senate that he didn't need authority. And the president sought authority, and his son did it twice, both for Afghanistan and for, uh, uh, for uh, uh, Iraq. Now, you can argue, well, gee whiz, maybe there's some misleading stuff in there. And I will say that the yellow cake, the 16 words, all of that, we, we've been through it all. We, there's no reason to go over it. But I would also remind people that there were 17 UN resolutions that were in violation, including the ceasefire arrangement 10 years before of the first Gulf War. And there was plenty there to justify the use of force. Whether it would have gotten the votes it got, I don't know. I, wasn't, I mean, I wasn't counting votes. But, but I, I mean, I think we can go overboard in, 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 uh, uh, in, in, in testing all this. The deployment, the, 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 to me, the big issue is, um, well, it's the gathering of intelligence. Um, and uh, I think, generally speaking, that involves things a lot more boring than uh, torturing people. And I don't think you need to do that, but if, if it had to happen, as Dershowitz wrote recently in the Wall Street Journal, uh, with certain safeguards, there isn't a president who wouldn't do it if he thought it would save lives. And there's no reason why a president shouldn't be able to do it if you knew you were going to save lives. But the big issues are uh, whether to deploy, uh, uh, put people in harm's way, soldiers in harm's way. And, um, that is not something a court's ever going to get into, uh, in my opinion, and uh, at least not the Supreme Court. And I think one district court did during the first Gulf War. But um, there, it's a political question. And I believe uh, the current White House has done it um, fairly above board and perhaps too effectively for the some of the people in this room. The Congress was never able to get its act together to cut the funds uh, recently, uh, this last fall, summer and fall. Uh, in, in Iraq. And, um, uh, but I don't think you can say it's abuse of power. He's doing that openly in, in negotiation, in bargaining, in, in, in a, in a, in a uh, uh, back and forth with the, with the Senate of the United States quite openly. And, uh, so Do you I'd, think that the, the Senate and the House, when they authorized the use of military force in Afghanistan and later in Iraq, do you think that they thought they were actually authorizing the other attendant policies that the administration now claims were authorized? Everything from um, warrantless wiretaps to, uh, to uh, certain interrogation techniques to, you name it, they're, they're, the administration claims that the authorization of use of, use of military force 
Well, again, it, a, a, it encompassed a great many things that a lot of people who voted for them <laughs> apparently don't think they voted for. It's a very good question, but authorizing use of force, uh, I think, subsumes within it uh, the uh, the uh, obtention, the, the, the attaining, uh, the, the, the gathering of intelligence necessary to do it in such a way as to be successful and to save lives. So uh, intelligence is the critical uh, aspect of war making. And uh, now, in some of the places where you have uh, extant law and you're, you're ignoring that, then you're in trouble, um, unless you are really on solid ground. And I, I have no doubt that if you parse through all this, the, the White House has made its share of mistakes. But no more, I think, than any previous administration. And I, you know, I maybe Beth can talk about one of my uh, sort of thought was amusing. I think the, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Beth, but, but and I don't know whether you were there at the time, but the Balkans, th there was no use of force. And, I, and in fact, um, I mean, no authorization for it. They just went in and used it. And my, my recollection is reading, uh, one of my former staff showed it to me, the, the, the justification for avoiding uh, an authorization to, to, to use force. They went under the War Powers Resolution, which allows you to uh, deploy force for 60 days before getting permission. And after 60 days, you've got to pull them all back, which is kind of why the, it's sort of a goofy law, which is why it's never really been applied. Um, but the, but the, as I'm told, the Clinton administration employed the doctrine, very elegant, of inter intermittent hostilities, uh, which means that the 60-day clock starts running every time a shot is fired, and then there's a gap between the next shot. And then the 60-day clock starts again. It's the doctrine of intermittent hostilities. Now, maybe I'm uh, making stuff up, but, uh, <laughs> but there was no authorization. How about it, Beth? Is he making stuff up? <laughs> I, I, I wasn't there. Um, I, I, I think that's a, a little... Um, uh, but you agree there was no authorization. Clever. There was well, no authorization I, used I for think you're, I think that you're turning the question around, though, because I think what's important here is not the... the as you said, um, there, you know, we're we're in Iraq. We got there. That's done. As you said earlier, um, the the questions I thought Nina was asking, which I think is a really important one for us, is what happens now with all the collateral decisions that have to be made with respect to the war on terror, and I think we have to understand. It's first of all, the president has a terrible burden in dealing with this. I, I wouldn't want to be president. I wouldn't want to have that burden. And I, I think we all have to respect that and understand that very hard decisions have to be made. But they are being made for our country. And they are being made for our country in ways that may affect our country forever. And the questions are, the questions to me, the important questions are, how do we make sure that our Constitution is honored in making these decisions, and our Constitution, by our Constitution being honored, I mean how do we make sure that to the extent possible, the relevant constitutional actors are playing their roles? And one of the things, Nina, you mentioned Jack Goldsmith's book, I thought one of his really telling points was, and we heard, we heard this early, earlier, I think, from Heather, too, about the president and the court have to act in some ways. Congress, uh, both because it's a, a large body that doesn't act um, by itself but has to act um, with agreement, Congress often has to be pushed to act. And I think the description of what Roosevelt did, in a way, is that he understood that was his responsibility and his role. And I don't think that President Bush has been working with Congress in the same way. Tony Lewis, you had something you wanted to say. Um, several things by now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. First of all, I wanted to say something to uh, Boyd and Gray about ex party Quirin. Whether it's good law, I don't know. But in his concurring opinion in, I think, the Hamdan case, Justice Scalia said of Quirin, was not, the high point. Not yes. this court's <laughs> finest hour. <No. laughs> so that sounds pretty strong to me. Um, then I, I really, carrying on from where Ambassador Gray and Beth Nolan uh, left off, I want to point out what seems to me the, the real difference between uh, what this administration has done, which I think is a greater difference than Ambassador Gray acknowledged, and the Roosevelt example, which uh, Jack Goldsmith did indeed emphasize. It isn't only that the present government, 
executive branch has been slow. It has positively resisted the idea of consulting Congress. That's the point of the Goldsmith book. When Jack Goldsmith, as Assistant Attorney General, proposed to Vice President Cheney, they were the decisive factors, Vice President Cheney and his then counsel, now Chief of Staff David Addington, that they go to Congress about warrantless wiretapping or go to Congress about other such issues. They said, no, we don't want to go to Congress. We don't want to indicate that they have any power in this at all. We want to do everything on our own. Now, that's the very attitude that Beth was, I think, implying, mm -hmm. but perhaps out of politeness, but did not actually <laughs> come out and say, uh, respect for the separation of powers, respect for the constitutional order. And the irony is, and this Goldsmith is certainly right about, had they asked Congress early on for the power to, to amend the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act and go for a warrantless wiretapping, Congress would have approved it in five minutes under the impulse of 9-11. If they had asked for other things, Congress would certainly have approved it, in my judgment. And even today, far down the line, Congress is mostly saying yes to the request of the executive branch. And it's that attitude that uh, it seems to me so different. We, are the, we want to safeguard our own power. We don't even want to ask their permission. I want to go back just a little bit to an interview I once did with a very distinguished fellow by the name of Boyden Gray, in which he described <laughs> how, <laughs> how he described how for decades post-Nixon, nobody wanted to use the words executive privilege. It was like a dirty epithet um, because of Watergate. And now, there seems to be, in the last few years, even the Bush administration really hesitated for a while. Now, it's Katie bar the door. And I'm wondering <laughs> what this panel thinks about the next president. And let's just say, for the sake of argument, that she has a rather large penchant for secrecy. <laughs> Do we really think that she's going to go back to the notion of open government, big Freedom of Information Act, come get them. Um, I'm not citing executive privilege because it might be difficult. Or do we think she's going to build on, should it be a she, the past six or seven years of greater secrecy, greater con condensation of executive power, and uh, sort of a new era? What do you think, Boyden, before you leave here? Well, gosh. Um I, 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 this goes back again to what I said earlier about the reporter's privilege and all of that. I, I just don't know how all that's going to sift out. Uh, what made executive privilege um, uh, a dirty word, uh, you know, John Dean can tell you why that is. Um, uh, he's, met, he's next. Um, and over time, you know, generations get older and generations come into place who weren't around, they were only 10 years old or whatever, uh, and, and who and who don't know what executive privilege once <laughs> was and, and now can, can deal with it again, and so it comes back to life. Uh, but I don't know that the courts are gonna give this administration on executive privilege any greater birth, and I don't know that, that uh, Fred Fielding's having any more success or doing anything differently than Beth did or I did, trying to reach accommodation with Congress, you know, loud words shouted in the press, back and forth, it's all part of a marvelous game of, uh, of uh, chicken. And um, I, I know that he's doing something different because I testified several times uh, as counsel to the president. Well, why, so. don't you, why don't you take over? <laughs> so uh, his assertion of privilege is quite different from what we were doing. But uh, since you were there for the last uh, Supreme Court case. <laughs> um, uh, which was a very this. narrow decision uh, as to it really only said that uh, Nixon had executive privilege vis-a-vis -vis having to require being required to turn over information to a grand jury. Uh, that's not very, very broad. It acknowledged the existence of the privilege on the basis of the separation of powers, but it was pretty narrow. He never did turn the documents over to the Congress, uh, the Senate Judiciary, excuse me, the Senate Watergate Committee nor the House Impeachment Committee. Uh, didn't get anything. 
So he was ready to still play hardball. Uh, I, I think when, when uh, Bowden was there, there was great, uh, I, was, I marveled at the excuses they had to not turn over information uh, without using the word executive privilege. It was really very creative. Uh, and we've seen, we've seen that again in, in the Bush too, uh, not to the same, of, of late we've certainly uh, seen it. And the bottom line has always been to me, yes, it is a political process, how much you can get the public even interested or educated, uh, but we now have come down with the new Attorney General to the very clear position that it went as Attorney General, he will not have his U.S. Attorney in the, for the District of Columbia, notwithstanding the statute to the contrary, uh, prosecute any contempt of Congress case. Uh, if the Congress doesn't dust off some rather rusty machinery where they are able to hold their own trials and at least uh, have sanctions within the terms of, the, uh, of any given Congress, uh, there may be no remedy for contempt of Congress because this administration has taken a very hard line that they will not take it to a grand jury. Uh, so that's where we are. There is no exec there's no sanction for violation of executive privilege. In fact, they don't even honor subpoenas. Uh, they won't uh, respond. They won't come before the Congress. They, it's just an in-your-face attitude uh, that uh, defies any respect for a co-equal branch, if you will. That, that position, the position that the Justice Department will not prosecute a contempt of Congress uh, for an official who who asserts executive privilege at the direction of the president is actually from a 1984 Office of Legal Counsel decision. Um, so it, it is quite longstanding in the executive branch, the theory that an executive branch official who's directed by the president to assert a privilege should not be subject to criminal um, uh, uh, penalties for following the president's but that's, direction. That's, that's OLC, and OLC, that's OLC, no court has ever ruled on this. A absolutely and, not. And it's OLC uh, can overrule its decisions at any time. OLC is making political decisions. Uh, they have the best interest of the president in mind. Uh, so it's a very self-serving decision that OLC, uh, I'm from very familiar with the case uh, uh, and, and the decision, and it's a pretty thin uh, bit of legal rationale. But, but it is 20, almost 25 years old, 23 years old. That doesn't well, get, and that, it doesn't that, have to be criminal, doesn't it? Couldn't, couldn't the Congress simply say, we should have it, that we, are seek, we have the power to seek a civil contempt, and that would have enormous uh, PR value. Even so I think only the Senate has civil contempt, and it's not available for executive branch. That's officials. right, but there's nothing that says they can't change that. They could, yes, they could change That's all the I'm, law. All I'm saying right. is they've sat there and let it be either an atom bomb or a nothing. I mean, it doesn't have to be that. It could be a carefully aimed shotgun. Well, there's even, there's even Supreme Court dicta. Uh, Scalia has said every branch has within its power the ability to enforce its own rules and regulations. Uh, so I think it's pretty uniformly recognized. And they've just been out, you know, the, the Congress has just been outfoxed by the Bush II administration on this issue based on this prior incident where the head of EPA almost uh, was ready to go to jail for uh, honoring executive privilege at the request of the president. But in the end, that is separation of powers. I think talking about it as a branch decision is more apt than talking about it as a self-serving executive position for the U U.S. Attorney General not to authorize a U.S. Attorney to prosecute the White House for pursuing a policy that the Attorney General has advised the White House that it has the constitutional prerogative to pursue. It does Nixon, put the weight... Nixon needed you for Archibald Cox. That was his argument for firing Cox. Fighting words. Um, <laughs> but I'm, I want to put the focus on Congress. Uh, and there is a reality that 2007, and November of 2007 is very late in a second term presidency. And for whatever political considerations are in the mix, the branch decision by the Congress is not to pursue the additional legislation or an aggressive use of the existing tools. And frankly, that is the way separation of powers is supposed to, to work. I mean, it goes back to Madison and the clash of ambition against ambition. Um, the Congress has made this choice. I do think it's very interesting as we're talking about this how little Supreme Court 
precedents there are for many of these um, incredibly important uh, legis uh, executive congressional um, battles that most of this is not going to be has not been decided and is not going to be decided by the Supreme Court and the role of the Office of Legal Counsel in the Department of Justice has um, because of that um, it, it, very significant importance and enhanced importance in this area of presidential power as compared to any other area in which it might opine. If I can just because I'm gonna have to leave and but I, so I want to say something to give and Beth a chance to respond back. Uh, one of the, um, what prompted me to, to jump in is that Beth is right. Most of these things get worked out, and it's a game of chicken. You know, all right, the Congress could uh, vote contempt, and then you have the political fallout of that, regardless of whether it's actually implemented in some way that, uh, that Congress can or cannot do by changing its own internal rules. But it's a game of chicken, and you really don't want to get to, get to the courts because you don't know how much you're actually going to lose if the courts actually get their hands on it. And I think, I, we always regretted that, that uh, because I, you, we use this, I don't know whether um, John, you were involved in this with, 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 with Walsh, we, we were able to claim, uh, we, we did, uh, without ever having it adjudicated, uh, attorney-client privilege, uh, which in some ways has a deeper, longer, more historical, deeper, deeper historical roots. Even, even against advice from the Office of Legal Counsel that you know, people, somebody who works in the government doesn't get attorney-client privilege. But we didn't, we still used it and used it effectively. Um, we and, lost that case. And, and, but, <laughs> b yes, you answered. We Beth never lost, lost that case. Beth took it, no, not Beth, but they took it all the way and lost it. So now that's a little, uh, a little uh, gimmick that's no longer so, just to go back to your original question, one of your original questions, uh, uh, Nina, if one of the reasons why you hear more about executive privilege today is because we don't have attorney-client privilege anymore. Uh, incidentally, Nixon claimed both executive privilege and attorney-client privilege on my testimony. Uh, I reminded him that attorney-client privilege doesn't apply to criminal activities. Uh, he said, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and executive privilege, uh, he decided to waive it. <laughs> you know, I remember, Gordon, I'm gonna let you go so you don't miss your train. Go, thank you. <laughs> that uh, some of the law clerks who worked for Justice Powell at the time of the Watergate case and the Nixon tapes case going to the Supreme Court said they knew that President Nixon was going to lose that case when Justice Powell stopped referring to him as President Nixon and simply referred to him as Nixon. <laughs> and having known Justice Powell, I think that was an accurate assessment. But I wonder how many of those cases, the outcome of those cases, turned to a significant degree on the character of the president involved. That that, I told that story for a reason and that so executive, he loses an executive privilege case that some other president might succeed in, in that the same thing happened to President Clinton, who was involved in his Monica Lewinsky problem, and therefore he loses a rather, rather important power that had been used by previous presidents or uh, privilege, and that was attorney-client privilege. In, in many regards, it's gone now for the, for the ages, as they say. And so, y you know, uh, one wonders whether the character of the individual president doesn't determine for other presidents what happens to them. Nina? Yeah. I think that's a very good question. In my mind, it, it comes, I'd like to talk a bit not about if, if what you meant was determines judicial decisions, but has an impact on the whole situation. I, I've always thought that the whole course of the Pentagon Papers case, going back to the Times decision to publish after having the documents for a month, uh, turned significantly on the character of Richard Nixon and his relationship with the press. Uh, the New York Times had historically been, had very close relations, and its leaders, uh, 
Washington correspondents like James Reston and so on had a very close relationship, personal relationship with the President, the Secretary of State, and all those people. They were on the phone, not with the President, but the Secretary of State. Secretary of State came to dinner, all that sort of thing. And they, when something secret came up, their a actual deepest instinct was to go to the White House and say, is it a good idea that we publish this? Is it okay if we publish it? What harm will it do? Not only did the Times not do that with the Pentagon Papers documents, it held them in a room at the New York Hilton Hotel under armed guard for a month, making sure that nobody in the administration would hear about it. It was the exact opposite of what, and that, I think, of course, it was partly due to the nature of the Vietnam War, which had taught us that we couldn't trust the government to tell the truth. But it also had something to do with the bad state of relations and lack of respect for Nixon as a truth teller in the White House. And I don't know how much of that uh, carried over into the judicial process, maybe not. But I just feel certain, and without being able to articulate it, that if somebody else had been president when this happened, the case would not have developed as it did develop. John Barrett, um, you know, I, I think I wasn't even 10 years old when Truman was president. So uh, I don't know how he was viewed, but my sense is that he wasn't viewed as a crook or as a liar. And still he lost the steel seizure case from his friends on the court. Well, it's uh, this issue of presidential popularity or perceived presidential caliber is in the mix in judicial decision making. Actually in, in spring of 40, in spring of 52, when the steel seizure case came to the court, Harry Truman was very damaged goods. His popularity was in the 20s. He had announced that he was not seeking an additional term in office. And the Korean War, which had been raging for two years was deeply unpopular. And that is the context of the steel seizure case. The court in the end treats it as domestic property seizure, but the Truman security argument was that he needed to keep the mills running to produce the steel to arm the forces that were fighting under UN auspices in Korea. And it is very much in the mix for the Supreme Court dealing with that matter on an expedited basis that Harry Truman and his administration plagued uh, with scandals below his level. I think there's an important distinction to be drawn between the, the caliber and integrity of President Truman and some of the things that, that surrounded him. Um, but, but that is in the mix. Also in the mix is the way his Department of Justice, which was plagued by mediocrity, argued the case. An assistant attorney general went into the district court to defend the steel seizure when the steel companies went in to seek an injunction and offered this description of presidential power. He said, the president is the common law descendant of the original sovereign, George III. <laughs> and the power of the presidency is the full sovereign power of George III, reduced only by the explicitly enumerated limits in the US Constitution. The same argument that's being made today. <laughs> well, Nixon, Nixon made that argument, of course. Exactly. George III in 1952. You like children are being George bad III now today. that Gordon Gay is gone. <laughs> it's, it's a laughably excessive argument. And when made by someone in a context of failure and perceived lack of candor to a country that has made up its mind about the president's performance, and, and maybe unfairly, History revisits these questions and reassesses. Harry Truman is a powerful, powerful example. But in that moment, in May of June of 1952, that's in the mix. And one of the six votes against Truman, concurring only in the result, is Justice Tom C. Clark, a Truman appointee, Truman's former attorney general. He's joined by Justice Harold Burton, another Truman appointee, his seatmate in the US Senate. Burton thought it was an easy case, executive excess, no problem. Clark thought it was a hard case. And in the end, I think it took him a while to sort of step back from his prior role and his reflexive legal support for Harry Truman. He concurred in the result, and, and Justice Jackson commented privately after the decision came down, Tom, congratulations on deciding to be a judge. <laughs> um, with Senator Sarbanes here, I want to 
return to the question of the authorizing of military force, not just in the current circumstance, but as somebody pointed out to me, the last time we actually had a formal declaration of war was World War II. We haven't had one. We've fought a lot of wars since then, but we've not had a formal declaration of war. Senator Sarbanes, um, is this just, is this a product of the smaller wars that we fight now and the instantaneous decisions that have to be made? Uh, is it not conceivable that we would ever have a formal declaration of war again? Um, and how, how are we to just reconcile that with, with the Constitution? Well, I think the obtaining of the authorizing of the use of force uh, deals with a lot of the constitutional question on the executive then going ahead. And um, President Bush did get authorization, not, not with my vote, but he did get authorization uh, to use force uh, with respect to Iraq. It, to pick up on your previous question, I do not think that the members of Congress uh, thought when they, those who voted for the authorization, that they were at the same time repealing the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act or pulling out of the, the uh, Geneva Convention with respect to the use of torture. I mean, and the effort to extend that authorization to cover that and to, to provide a, a, a uh, a cloak of legitimacy I uh, completely reject. It really goes back in part to what Tony Lewis said about the attitude with which this reach of executive power is asserted, which has a, a lot to do, I think, with the, the reaction you get from the other branches of the government. I was struck yesterday when uh, Justice O'Connor spoke about the Merriman case, uh, where Lincoln took that extraordinary step uh, but as I understood her comment about it, Lincoln wasn't asserting, well, this is the reach of executive power and I can do this anytime I want, anywhere I want, and so forth and so on. He hedged it in. He went to Congress as soon as Congress came back to get to, to get the congressional uh, sanction for it. He limited what he was doing in a very narrow way, and that's in sharp contrast in my view, with the assertions that are being made now about the reach of, the, of executive power. Now, the question is, well, you know, why doesn't the Congress try to check that more? And that's, I think, a very legitimate question. I have to tell you, and I, I want to thank you for the chance to come up here. You know, as a f recent senator, now a former senator, this helps you to accomplish the transition. To at, least get, <laughs> <laughs> to at least get some chance. Yeah, well, not all <laughs> former senators are Rhodes Scholars. I mean, <laughs> it's, you know. Yeah, but um, I think that the uh, these assertions of the of the reach of executive power. Part of the problem is the Congress. Fewer people in the Congress regard themselves first and foremost, as a member of the independ uh, an independent branch of the government who have a major responsibility to carry out the checks and balances of the Constitution. And they make more of an identification as being a partisan, a political partisan, either aligned with or against the president, who becomes then the... I can't help being a radio reporter. All right, the party, oh, that's much better. Thank you very much, Nina. Uh, the party, uh, who's the party leader. And so the tendency now is to, you know, if you're of the same party, you support the president. If you're not of the same party, you know, you oppose the president. It's interesting about Roosevelt, uh, the efforts he made leading up to World War II to try to consult the Congress, to draw the Congress in, to get some congressional approval or sanction for what he wanted to do, or at least some assurances that they would not um, resist him strongly if he went ahead and did some of these things. But the extent of consultation and the interaction that was taking place between the executive and the legislative branches is. I think very interesting to read about. And, and you really don't have that now. You, we've lost a lot of that. 
And I think one reason we've lost it is this breakdown in terms of now the partisan identification that is made. And secondly, uh, certainly with this administration, an assertion about the reach of executive power and, and, and the attitude, well, we don't, we don't really have to consult with you. Although I do give the Bush administration credit for coming to the Congress to get an authorization uh, with respect to, to Iraq. I mean, they came, they got it, they got it by a very quite substantial vote. And that, uh, I think, um, I mean, I think it was a bad decision and I think it looks even worse in retrospect, but I thought at the time it was not a wise decision. It wasn't a good judgment, uh, but I don't, I don't think Bush has, in effect, in that sense, violated the Constitution. Now, it's a different question on the assertions they're making, making about surveillance and about torture and about some of these other measures that they, then, then they make these bold assertions about the reach of executive power. Boyd and Gray basically said that Congress is not to be trusted, that you, it's a, it leaks like a sieve. You can't really consult Congress when you can't trust that things will remain secret. I'm not sure if that's true or not. I, I think on some things, clearly, Congress is a sieve. I've personally never been the beneficiary of a national security leak, much as I'd like to be. But I, I it, it, it seems to be, it certainly has been the experience of some presidents, maybe all recent presidents, that they have on some occasions briefed Hill leaders about something they thought was terribly important in the national security area where there was a compromise of that information. I, 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 I wouldn't go on the Intelligence Committee for the following reasons. I had the, the leadership would ask me from time to time whether I wanted to go on the Intelligence Committee. Of course, if you go on the Intelligence Committee, uh, then you're bound not to talk about anything you heard at the sessions of the Intelligence Committee. I talked to people who served on the Intelligence Committee and they said, well, you know, they go in in the Intelligence Committee and either they would be told something they had already read a day or two before in either the New York Times <laughs> or the Washington Post or, or, or some other newspaper for that matter, or, or they, they would read it a few days later. And I thought to myself, well, how will you ever separate out the two? If you go on the Intelligence Committee, you're just binding yourself never to talk about all these issues, which everyone else is talking about on the basis of the information which is appearing in the newspapers. <laughs> Actually, I think the Congress basically is, it's not the Congress, because the Congress sets up procedures. Beth, uh, Beth made a very important point earlier when she was talking about setting up the right processes by which these decisions are reached. And, and that's terribly important because it, it enhances the chances that you will make wise decisions and it gives you greater assurance that you're not gonna make some foolish, uh, uh, foolish decision. So it, it, it's an, an, an important point to bear in mind, but the Congress sets up processes. I mean you know, consultation with a very small group is considered as consultation with the Congress and gives the executive a, a sort of a, a, a mandate to, to, proceed, to proceed ahead. Generally speaking, I think uh, that's been pretty well honored. Now, occasionally there's a, there's a breach, but better to pay the price of the breach than to go down the path of asserting and conceding to a sort of an unlimited reach of executive power. You have to consider what is the better for the society. Do you guys have questions for each other? Before I continue, I mean, do you, any of you have questions you wish to ask each other? Oh. Are we gonna have a chance for any later comment? Uh you can come? say whatever you want, Tony. I could never shut you up. Tell me, <laughs> tell me what you'd I like me to you ask you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I just had a general observation that we haven't approached, um, and that is the distinctive <clears throat> character and danger for the matters we're talking about of the war on terror. 
And it's different from, uh, for example, World War II with the Supreme Court, with the, the government, as was pointed out uh, by John Barrett, uh, deciding, or was it John or somebody else, deciding to end the uh, Japanese program uh, the day before the Supreme Court decided the Endo case. Uh, but the war was coming to an end. We all knew that it was slowly, still with much pain ahead, was coming toward an end. Now, nobody knows when the war on terror is going to end. It's not going to end in my lifetime, and I doubt if it will end in anybody's lifetime in this room. That puts a very different premium on respect for civil liberties and respect for the Constitution, because after all the other er episodes, including the Japanese one, in which we violated civil liberties during a war, when the war was over, we generally apologized for the mistakes, and we eventually uh, apologized to the Japanese Americans and paid them modest compensation. But when is that going to happen in the war on terror? What's going to be done to uh, Hamdi and Padilla? Think of this, ladies and gentlemen. I, it really is something that disturbs me profoundly. The, the Bush administration has asserted, did assert in the past tense, it no longer does, I think, that it had the power unilaterally, without any other support in law or congressional action, to label any American citizen, that is anybody, any of us, as enemy combatants, take us into custody, hold us in solitary confinement forever without counsel. And it asserted at first that no court could examine that detention. Right. No court could examine that detention. You'd just be put away somewhere and you couldn't go, to, you had no lawyer. And if somebody, your father happened to hear about it and filed a habeas corpus petition on your behalf, the court would have to dismiss it without consideration. Now that's an astonishing assertion in the American context, ladies and gentlemen. And it all stemmed from the war on terror, which is an endless war. So I think that assertions of unilateral executive power in the war on terror have a unique dangerousness that we ought to care about. Well, I must say that I've always been sort of puzzled that, that the court the Supreme Court, which is after all a much more conservative court than at any time in my lifetime, was willing to examine these questions, at least some of them, relatively early on. I mean, the history of civil liberties in wartime is that the court doesn't get involved. Sometimes it'll say to the, to the executive branch, you were wrong when you did that, but that's over. They wait till after the war's over. But really pretty early on, this Supreme Court, by an eight to one vote in Hamdi, was shoving back pretty hard. And that I find really remarkable in terms of the historical panoply that we can look at in the American experience. That's an encouraging point, Nina. I just want to say that I think an unspoken factor in that willingness of the court to intervene when it did is the very thing I've just men right. mentioned, that the judges were aware that this was a war without end and that there wasn't going to be the opportunity to come along after four years and say there was a mistake in the past. And that the, the authority being asserted by the executive branch was not a particular and narrow program, mm -hmm. but one that had um, such far-reaching effect, and I think that combination of endless in time and uh, far-reaching uh, really makes it different, Nina, from any other program the Supreme Court had been faced with. Well, I, let me just footnote that. It strikes me that the courts may well be assisting the executive in this regard because there's certainly a mixture right now on decisions on questions of whether some of these matters are, are state secrets. Uh, whenever we look behind the state secrets document, it often looks more like a fraud than it does like a legitimate excuse. Uh, right down to the leading case that the Supreme Court did decide, what was that, Reynolds. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have a number, we have a mixed bag right now in the, in the circuits where some are are honoring state secrets, others are not, and there is a, uh, 
this, this is going to have to, I suspect, be litigated sooner or later by the Supreme Court. I'd like to hear how John thinks this, this is going to be resolved. Well, I was struck by Senator Sarbanes' comment that most or many members of Congress do not think of themselves as part of a co-equal branch with its own responsibility for the separation of powers. Um, I think that's sad, it's understandable, uh, but by contrast, I do think what we have seen in the post 9-11 adjudications is a continuing consciousness on the part of the courts that they are a distinct and independent branch. And I think that in part that connects to the appointments process um, and is affected by who comes to serve on the court. Um, it also goes to longevity and historical perspective. I think it matters deeply that Justice Stevens has served for more than 30 years and that he's a World War II vet and that he's been around this track or tracks like these in many different contexts from his time as a law clerk in the 1940s to his service on the court since 1975. Um, I'm concerned as a general matter and I guess specifically on the state secrets question that John raises that a court that doesn't have this kind of branch independence mindset is going to be susceptible to that kind of argument. The Reynolds precedent is there and, and venerable if controversial. Uh, only a few justices dissented from that claim. Jackson, one of them, but the claim prevailed in the 1950s. Um, and it's about an area of enumerated or implicit executive prerogative as we've understood national security and classification and responsibility. And I would hope that people aren't on the court who are overly deferential but to that as yeah. another well, you branch's have, You job. have to go back, to, people have to go back through American history and understand how this was structured. You get, people will come to you and say, how many presidents did you serve under? <laughs> Now think of that question. How many, you say you've been in the Senate a long time, how many presidents did you serve under? Well, of course, Bob Byrd has been preaching. He gives a speech every year to the incoming new members of the Congress that he's never served under any presidents. He served with presidents. And it became so ingrained in me now that a woman came up to me a, you know, a few months ago. She said, how many presidents did you serve under? And instinctively, Without even thinking about that, none. I haven't served under any. I've served with, and then I, you know, but, but, but there's a failure to understand how this system is going to work. And if you don't understand it, and the checks and balances aren't working, and then a time of crisis comes that can be invoked. I'm thinking now particularly of the executive, which can, um, a, a lot of your basic, um, freedoms and liberties may be, may be in question. John, you want yeah, to? Yeah, I, I, listening to Michael Dorff's numbers as to the makeup of those who come from the executive branch doesn't bode well for how these people on the Supreme Court may ultimately rule given their deference and uh, roots in the executive branch on the issue of state secrets. And if state secrets is supported, it, it's just going to be one other block for Americans ever knowing uh, and understanding what we're doing and giving anybody a remedy for when we make mistakes. I want to explain something to here for anybody who doesn't know what the state secrets privilege was and what the cases were discussing. It was a case brought by the widows of some uh, airmen who had been killed in a uh, test pilot run, and they wanted to know what the cause, what had caused this accident that had killed their husbands, and the government, this is I think in the 1950s, invoked this so-called state secrets privilege, saying it could basically decide what it was going to tell people, and this information here, it asserted to the courts and to the Supreme Court, would compromise national security, that there were, in, in this case, that there were secrets about the, the weaponry involved that would, if found out by the Russians or the Soviets at the time, 
um, would compromise national security, and so the case was lost for the widows. And I don't know how many decades later, they finally declassified this report that the widows. His daughter had found the one of the daughters found the information on the internet. And there was nothing in it about any weapon systems or any anything. It was totally nothing. <laughs> But it has remained the precedent, and all that the government has to do is say that there's a state secret, and goodbye. And very re just last week, the Second Circuit Court of Appeals posted on its website a decision in the case of an Egyptian who had been detained after 9-11, erroneously. And, um, and he sued the FBI agents who detained him on a personal basis. And the Second Circuit allowed the case to go forward and posted its decision on its website and then pulled it down. And Howard Basham from How Appealing, which is a, a blog, had seen it. So he had the whole original opinion. And the original opinion, and he posted it. So I've got it, and so can anybody else. And you can compare it with the one that the Second Circuit then put up when, I assume, after the administration uh, objected and wanted part of it sealed. And the part that's missing is the uh, part that summarizes the tactics used by the FBI in questioning this man. I can't see how it's a threat to national security, but somebody thinks it is. And, and, and the courts will not look at these issues. They will not look behind the claim of state secrets once it's invoked. <laughs> so the court makes a blind decision the way it now stands, and they, just on the and word you can, of the Senate. You can understand, to some extent, why they might do that, too. I mean, <laughs> they don't know. They're, they don't want to be there saying, OK, you can put this up, and it's the basis for the next terrorist attack. They're not crazy. The question is, what leads people in the executive branch to make such outrageous claims uh, in the first place in exercising their authority or their power? And in the case you just talked about, when it all came out, you look at that and you say, well, on what basis was that being done? What, was the, what reasonable case was there for doing that? And of course, you need to put yourself in the in the position of the of the people that were seeking the information and being denied it. Just like Tony Lewis said, you have to think of these people that are being uh, this assertion that they can pick anyone up, declare you an enemy combatant, hold you incommunicado for an indefinite length of time. When did America stand for that? When did that become what we stand for? And why do we need a court to tell people holding responsible positions in the executive branch that you're not supposed to engage in this kind of, in this kind of conduct? I mean, there has to be some self-restraint as well on the part of people who hold authority. Let me, let me just for one moment, though, play the role of the Bush administration, unaccustomed as I am to doing that, <laughs> and note that a good deal of these cases, like Hamdi, I, I don't know what would have happened in the ensuing years if there hadn't been a Hamdi decision. But m most of that conduct, Padilla, Hamdi, that particular, the detention of American citizens occurred in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, when I think it's fair to say that everybody in the federal government was stark, staring, terrified about what was next. And what would have been the consequence if it turned out that Hamdi or that Padilla did have a neutron, uh, a dirty bomb, and was ha getting it somehow over here to put in, into place into Chicago? Well, how long there would have been 9-11 hearings squared about the failure to do something about it. How long do you think he should have been kept in that status? Don't push me too far in the role <laughs> of the Bush administration <laughs> advocate. The, Nina, the other, the other thing is, in, in, def, in taking the position of the Bush administration, they didn't take it just in the immediate aftermath, uh, this whole motif of secrecy that they've imposed. Uh, it starts before 9-11, uh, 
and it accelerates with 9-11, right. and it has continued to this day. And it is not just in using things like state secrets, it is across the board, and it's a part of a belief they've had that when they returned to power in 2001, that they found a weakened presidency because of Vietnam and Watergate. That is a totally fallacious argument. It is not true. Uh, the Reagan, by the end of the Reagan administration, uh, the presidency had powers greater than Richard Nixon's fondest dreams. Uh, and so they have gone way beyond, and they've just used 9-11 as an exercise to gain and augment presidential powers, to bring us totally out of balance uh, and forget the separation of powers. I'm going to end this. Um with a much smaller question, but it seems the suitable question for this audience. And that is about the Presidential Records Act, which uh, the Presidential <laughs> Records Act initially basically made all presidential records subject to classification concerns um, available after 12 years. And when President Bush came into office, he issued an executive order that basically allowed any living president to extend that time period and then to give himself, President Bush, the sitting president, an unlimited time then to review upon that. The result is that the Presidential Records Act is, is a mere shadow of its former self, let's put it that way. Uh, do we need a new act? Could we get a new act? Would Congress? Do, Looking at the Congress today, do you think that Congress would be willing to put a, a Presidential Records Act into place with more teeth that was less subject to interpretation by executive order? Well, presumably, anything they tried to do would be vetoed. So the question you're really asking, if you try to do that, is for the next president. Is uh, as long as he can hold on to one third of one house only, he can negate any corrective action that the Congress may try to take. And that, that needs to be kept in mind as you try to evaluate, um, evaluate uh, congressional actions. But if we look forward to the next president, forget this president for the moment. It can be Difficult repealed. as that may be for you to do, Senator Sarbanes. <laughs> is this, it, can, can this be done, or is this just a casualty of our times. It can be repealed. I followed the 78 Act since it was adopted, since Bush gutted it. Uh, it is now still in a very abbreviated form pending in a federal district court in the District of Columbia uh, in a summary judgment motion which has never been ruled on because the White House did provide 60 some documents of, from the Reagan administration uh, that really prompted the lawsuit by a group of historians. But if you look at the, the act itself, it not only grants a, the power of executive privilege to the president after he leaves, it also grants it to the vice president. In fact, it grants it to the family of a former president. It grants it to everybody excepting Barney uh, <laughs> has the ability to invoke executive privilege. So this... This can be repealed and will probably be repealed as one of those things that happened during the transition when they're cranking out the new executive orders. You can expect this one to disappear. The problem is this president is going to walk out and there are going to be no papers left. Uh, I understand that there is an occasional truck that goes in and out of the Naval <laughs> Reserve uh, or Naval Observatory in Washington where the vice president's residence is and it literally has a sign on its face that it's a document destruction truck. Uh, this is how in your face he is about getting rid of whatever's there. So he, and, and Cheney has made it very clear he believes the act is unconstitutional, therefore he has the right not to, uh, to apply it. Uh, Beth made an interesting argument. Well, he's not argument. a member of the executive branch, remember. Right. Well, that's right. But Beth, Beth made an interesting statement about, you know, occasionally when there is an unconstitutional law, that there are occasions when a president may not want to apply it. Uh, the classic case to me has always been the way Clinton handled the situation when, he, when his veto was overridden on the uh, amendment to dismiss everybody from the armed services who was HIV positive. And he said, I will not enforce it. 
uh, and what he was able to do in taking that strong position because he believed it was unconstitutional is he was able to get the Congress to change it. Uh, and that seems to me the intelligent way when you get a, an act like this. But in this case, you can just have a president change it. Any last thoughts before I close this down? Senator Sarbanes. Well, uh, first of all, I want to thank Nina, who's done a terrific job <laughs> moderating all day long. Now you see why he was elected like 50 times. And, and also to, to, to commend the presidential libraries, and particularly this one, who has been the host library, uh, and the archives, and the Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt Institute for putting on this uh, terrific conference. I was sitting there and I, I was thinking to myself, how can we get members of Congress to come and sit through one of these <laughs> sessions? You know, and I, I just hold want, a fundraiser. Uh, yeah. Very <laughs> <laughs> good. And, and I'd be remiss if I didn't particularly thank uh, Bill Vandehoevel for the extraordinary leadership he's provided to the institute since we well, found. Uh, Founded it and then provided such as has provided such extraordinary leadership, and we're indebted to him. And I just want to close on a sort of a light uh, personal note. Um, I have enormous uh, respect and admiration for Franklin Roosevelt. I think he was one of our three great presidents, Lincoln and Lincoln and Washington being the other two. And uh, I I want to tell you this story because. Uh, Norm Dorson told the story about saying to the daughters of the American Revolution, welcome fellow immigrants. And my parents came to this country as immigrants, immigrants from Greece, and I grew up in a household that had enormous reverence for President Roosevelt. Um, Joseph Alsop has written a book about President Roosevelt, and he said the thing that Franklin Roosevelt did for the United States, he included in large groups of people who previously had felt they were excluded out, out of American uh, society, and we certainly felt that in my family. I had a summer job when I was in college. I, went, I was selling fuller brushes. I don't know how many of you remember the fuller brush salesman. <laughs> well, they would come and, you know, you would knock on people's doors. Nowadays, you don't do it. They think it's a... a, a potential robber or something, they won't open the door. And people would open the door and you try to get yourself invited in so you could show your, your wares. You carried a little kit with you that had some of the, and, and you had a number of different items that you could give as free samples. And you'd usually, you know, at the end, even if you hadn't made a sale, you'd leave one of these free samples. So I knocked on this door, the housewife, this housewife came to the door. One of the reasons you don't have them anymore, there are no housewives anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so the lady asked me in, I sat down, we were in, in, her, in a very, very modest home, and uh, they had a picture of Franklin Roosevelt up on the wall. And we started talking, we went through, and then I finished, and I want you to know, I ended up giving that lady every one of my free samples. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, Roosevelt Library. Thank you, Roosevelt Institute. Again, I want to thank all of the presidential libraries, all of their staff, all of the wonderful panelists, everybody who worked so hard to make this two-day conference a success. And uh, it, as you can tell, it took an enormous amount of work by people who are not sitting up here to get all the nice words of, of praise. So thank you to everybody. And I would like to thank Nina Totenberg. Can we have a round of applause for what she has done for us today? And if you haven't purchased your Nina Toten bag, which will benefit the NPR station nearest you, do so in our store. We are, and I, I too want to echo all of those thanks to all of the people who have made, made this um, conference possible, but I'd like to just take a moment before we have our closing session 
to say some special thanks to the staff members who have worked so hard on this. The planning team here at the Roosevelt Library was headed by Lynn Bassanis, our deputy director, who has been working on this project um, since February of 2006 and has been living with it day and night. And I just want like a round of applause for Lynn Bassanis. Bob Clark, who is our supervisory archivist, has been guiding our thinking processes and our legal acumen every step of the way, and assisted by David Woolner of the Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt Institute. Thank you to our two <laughs> minds. Cliff Lobby is our public affairs specialist, and he has done um, the design of our materials, our logistical arrangements, every aspect of this has been part of Cliff's very, very broad portfolio, and I'd also like to thank Cliff for everything that he has done for this project. We also have had a full um, core of volunteers and staff in here who have been um, working very, very hard these past few weeks, and um, especially the past few days. I thank them, and I thank the Roosevelt Institute staff and Chris Bryseth, their president, for his hard work on behalf of this conference. Bill Boxer, our volunteer photographer. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> and Philippa Ewing, who has handled our press work. Uh, she has done a fantastic job, and I know you're going to be hearing all about this conference for days and weeks to come because she's managed to get some national placement on it. So thank you all. And um, at this point, again, I'd like to thank our panelists and Nina. We're going to invite Bill Vanden Heuvel to come up and also have John Barrett stay there and do a brief wrap-up of the, of the session. We were hoping that President, former President Bill Clinton would be with us, but unfortunately that's just not possible this close to the election. So, Bill. Stay where you are. It's going to be very short, this wrap-up. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you, Alan Weinstein. Thank you, Sharon Fawcett. Thank the National Archives. All of the presidential libraries who've made this extraordinary conference possible, I want to thank you. And Chris Bryseth, the president of the Roosevelt Institute. Dick French was here today. Anna Eleanor Roosevelt our co-chair, thank them, and all of the directors who came today. I was especially pleased that David Ginsburg was with us for this conference. He was with us at the beginning when we founded this. He was with us at the beginning of the Roosevelt administration. So to have David here is a great honor, and I'm very grateful for that, and his participation is important. I want to um, thank, of course, the, those who have conducted this uh, extraordinary symposium. To Alan Brinkley and to Alan Weinstein and to Nina Totenberg for moderating these and for all of the participants. The presence of Sandra Day O'Connor made a great difference. To have her here, for us to have the personal opportunity to talk to her and to exchange points of view. I was especially pleased today at lunch when she was still here since she was appointed by President Reagan to tell her the story of when I went to see President Reagan with Claude Pepper to discuss the possibility of financing the Roosevelt uh, Memorial in Washington, D.C. And Ronald Reagan said, I voted four times for Franklin Roosevelt, and he was the greatest president of this century. So I was glad to give that little wisdom to Justice O'Connor so that she could carry that back to Arizona <laughs> with her, too. Uh, what has been discussed here today, of course, is the ongoing dialogue of a democracy. We have inspected two of the independent branches of our government. Paul Sarbanes has made a very important suggestion. This same conference, the presidency and the Congress would be a very important conference to have as well. And I think the way we're ending up as the questions have been focused is extraordinary too. Because as I listened to this, I thought of how very important the question is, what is war in the context of our Constitution? In 2002, Robert Byrd came here to receive one of the Four Freedom Awards. He gave one of his great speeches where he had called for the invocation of the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, where he says only the Congress can declare war. It's not for the President to declare war. And we've now gotten into the habit with Korea, with Vietnam, with Iraq, twice, to allow the Congress to make 
to vote on a resolution, whether it was the Tonkin Bay resolution or the Iraq resolution, that allows the use of force, but then is used to declare and operate as though a full war has been declared. Franklin Roosevelt was very, con very, very careful about his constitutional obligations. When Winston Churchill at the Atlantic Charter Conference said the United States must come into this war, he reminded him that it had to come in through a constitutional process. I am a, really, when I hear people say that this crisis of terrorism is the greatest crisis since the Civil War, which the Attorney General designate has just said in his testimony, it appalls me to think that what we went through in World War II, what Roosevelt had to confront, the Nazis controlling all of Europe with the strongest military force the world had ever seen, with a scientific community that was totally capable of producing the nuclear weapon itself, and whoever was going to get there first was going to win that war, with the United States 17th in the world in military power in 1941 behind Portugal, with the Congress of the United States by one vote extending the Selective Service Act in August of 1941, just months before Pearl Harbor, President Roosevelt confronted a crisis, and even that terrible crisis where we lost half of our fleet in Pearl Harbor and 3,000 dead, he did not react to it with fear. He went before the Congress, confident as he was then, as he was in 1933, as his inaugural, to say we have nothing to fear because we are America, and we know our strength and our power and our possibility. <laughs> to call this war in a situation where if the President had read the intelligence briefings on August 6, 2001, that warned him that Obama, Osama was going to attack our airports, that the whole thing could have been avoided if a simple regulation of the FAA regarding pilot security could have been enforced, and to now to have spent more than a trillion dollars and to take our nation where we are abandoning our constitutional obligations is appalling to me. And so you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put on this button re-elect Roosevelt because the time has come. And thank you for being here today.